Right, hello. Good morning, everyone. Thanks to all of you for coming along. I'm Jenny Jopson. I work at the Wellcome Trust. I'm just going to say a few words on behalf of the Wellcome Trust who are supporting today this strand, the ethical battles in science and medicine. So I'm really delighted that the Wellcome Trust are able to support this strand. I myself have attended the Battle of Ideas quite a few times in the last few years. I've also had the privilege of being a judge in the heats of um, debating matters. So I've seen firsthand the quality and the effectiveness of the work that the Institute of Ideas does. Um, and for those of you who don't know, the Wellcome Trust, we're a charitable trust. We're based in Euston and we fund biomedical research both here in the UK and in um, low-income countries. Um, but as well as being um, very passionate about the importance of biomedical research, we're also passionate about public engagement. Um, and we fund public engagement through a very active grant scheme. Um, and it's through this scheme that we have supported the Institute of Ideas for over a decade now, through both debating matters and through the battle of ideas. Thank you, Jenny. So yeah, my name's Sandy Starr. I also work for a charitable trust in the field of biomedicine, uh, a rather smaller one than the Wellcome Trust, <laughs> called the Progress Educational Trust, uh, and I'm the convener um, of the uh, Ethical Battles in Science and Medicine strand that's going to be going on uh, in this room uh, throughout today. I'd like to thank the Wellcome Trust uh, for their continuing and invaluable support uh, of the Battle of Ideas Festival and other uh, Institute of Ideas uh, events and initiatives. As Jenny has mentioned, uh, their support goes back a long way, and today's strand of debates uh, has emerged from the themes of several previous uh, Battle of Ideas strands of debates uh, that I've been involved in and that the Wellcome Trust has supported, uh, most notably the Battle for Reproductive Choice in 2009, uh, the battle over scientific evidence in 2010, uh, and the battle for our brains uh, last year in 2011. And with today's strand, we're going to be examining how the whole area of biomedicine uh, relates to the subject of freedom, uh, which is a key theme uh, of this year's Battle of Ideas Festival. I'd like to hand over to Helen Birtwistle, uh, who's going to chair this next debate. This session is called Organ Donation, Dead or Alive. My name's um, Helen Birtwistle. I'm the chair of this session as well as being a Battle of Ideas committee member and an associate fellow of the Institute of Ideas. So let me start just by setting the scene very briefly. The debate surrounding organ donation has been a very lively one over recent years. The question of whether to introduce presumed consent or an opt-out system in particular has been widely discussed, both on a practical level, would presumed consent see a rise in organ donation figures, and also, on an ethical level, would presumed consent undermine particularly individual autonomy and decision-making? A further um, but less discussed area of contention, and one that also touches on questions of personal autonomy, is the definition and diagnosis of death and its, relation, its relationship to organ donation. The ethics of organ transplantation are largely based on brain death. That's the certainty that brain activity is irreversibly over. Um, and that ethic um, has allowed, really, for the harvesting of organs from the cadaver while the heart is still beating. Apart from divergences of scientific opinion as to what counts as an irreversible loss of brain activity, there is now some debate about what the ability of the body to survive such a loss might actually mean for the ethics of organ transplantation. But before we actually kick off with, with the debate, I'd like to introduce what is an incredibly impressive panel of, uh, of speakers. Let me introduce them um, very briefly and in the order in which they're going to speak. First, let me introduce uh, Dr. Sir Peter Simpson, who's the chairman of the UK Donation Ethics Committee. Peter has a long and impressive medical career um, and has previously served as the president of the Royal College of Anaesthetists um, before taking up his current role. Second to speak, um, and at the end there, we have Stephen Edwards, who's the Professor of Philosophy of Healthcare at Swansea University. He was previously a psychiatric nurse and then moved into academia and has worked um, on the areas of relativism, philosophy of mind, nursing ethics, nursing philosophy and disability. And his current research... Um, has been very much within our area, so we really do have a real expert in him on the panel, so it's really great to have you with us, Steve. 
Next to speak, sitting next to me on my left, is Dr um, Stuart Derbyshire, who's a reader in psychology at the University of Birmingham. His academic work focuses on neuroimaging and pain, and he's written extensively on that area. But it, his academic work also touches on far um, deeper questions in the sense of what it actually means to be human and how experience develops. Consequently, S Stuart speaks and writes on a huge range, range of topics. Fourth to speak at the end there um, is Hugh Whittle, who's the director of the Nuffield Council of Bioethics, who are one of the most important organisations looking at ethical questions raised by new developments in biological and medical research today. He's worked in policy roles in a number of different organisations, mostly in areas where developments in health and science give rise to social and ethical concerns. And again, um, please do look him up. He's extremely impressive. It's great to have you, uh, have you with us, Hugh. And last but by no means least, we have Professor David Jones, who's the director of the Anscombe Bioethics Centre, um, who, of course, I've already mentioned. In addition um, to his role at Anscombe, he's a vice chair of the Ministry of Defence Research Ethics Committee. He's an external examiner for the Diploma on Medicine and Philosophy, which is run by the Society of Apothecaries. And he was on a working party of the General Medical Council as well. So, Peter, if I could ask you to kick us off. Helen, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. My background is in clinical medicine. And until I retired, I was a consultant anaesthetist specialising in neuroanesthesia and intensive care. As doctors, medical doctors, I'm sure many of you are much more important than ordinary medical doctors, but as medical doctors, we've got a responsibility to diagnose death in all situations. This has got to be done in a clinical and practical way, while at the same time being sensitive to the requirements of particular beliefs and faiths. And in the UK, and I'm, I'm talking, I must stress, about the UK, the procedure for diagnosis is laid out in the 2008 Code of Practice published by the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges. Now, in that code, I make no apology for saying that I'm going to talk to you about how we actually diagnose death and why. In that code, there is one diagnosis of death, there are two ways of diagnosing it, and there are three phases to the, pr the process by which you diagnose it. So, in the medical definition of death, as defined in the code, is the irreversible loss of the capacity for consciousness together with the irreversible loss of the capacity to breathe, breathe alone. It's diagnosed either using uh, cardiovascular criteria, in other words, the heart stops, and that's normally after cardiorespiratory arrest, or by neurological criteria when we diagnose brain stem death. Not brain death, brain stem death. And there are three phases to that process, and this is very important if we're trying to emphasize to people how reliable it is. The first of these is to satisfy a whole series of preconditions. The first of which is, if you're talking about uh, neurological death, you know why the patient is in coma. So you know the cause for the condition they're in at the time. You exclude factors which may colour and therefore prevent you making a reliable diagnosis. For example, temperature, drugs, sedative drugs, relaxant drugs and so on, or metabolic abnormalities, or abnormalities of blood sugar, blood chemistry, uh, endocrine abnormalities and so on. Once you've done those, once you've excluded those, you may then embark on the diagnostic process. And once you've made the diagnosis, you then have to confirm that diagnosis after a time interval. Now, this is really important that you have all those three things in place. In the vast majority of cases, death's diagnosed using cardiovascular criteria. But in recent years, and due to advances in medical technology and treatment, there are a relatively small number of people for whom that's actually inappropriate. These are people who've suffered a primary or a secondary catastrophic brain injury, usually following a trauma or a stroke. And what happens in these people is that the brain is seriously damaged seriously compromised, as a result of which, like any other part of the body, when it's injured, it swells. But the brain sits inside a closed bony box, 
So as it swells, it pressurises itself even more and damages itself even more and cuts off its blood supply even more just due to pressure. Eventually what happens is that the brain decompresses itself because the brain stem at the bottom part herniates out through the base of the skull, down through what we call the foramen magnum, and it's the brain stem that does that bit, and that's called coning. And when somebody cones, it means that the blood supply to their brain stem has been cut off. Now, when that happens, it's very obvious. If you're looking after an intensive care patient and they cone, it's very obvious. I won't go into how it is, but it, it is so. And in cases like that, we then need to embark on diagnosis of brain stem death using the code. Now, when we use the neurological criteria, we have to know why they're in coma, we have to meet the preconditions, and then we neurologically test them, including testing of apnea or their inability to breathe. These tests are performed by two doctors on two occasions, both of whom must have been qualified for five years, one of whom must be a consultant, and both of them have to be trained and experienced in brainstem death testing. And the second set, once you do the first set, you then wait a time and then you do the second set. And after the second set are done, you can withdraw treatment. In other words, effectively, this is part of normal end-of-life care for patients and not an artificial construct for organ donation. This is important whatever the circumstances are. The patients concerned will often have been in ITU for several days, and people will have got to know them, they know their pathology, and when they eventually cone, it will be all too apparent. I personally, um, uh, if patients who are, have expressed a wish to donate organs are part of that end-of-life care, once brain stem death has been diagnosed and confirmed, then that can proceed. And doctors have a duty to ensure that such expressed wishes are fulfilled. Thus, we need a reliable clinical method of testing. And personally, I'm fully confident that the clinical criteria that we use here uh, for diagnosis and confirmation of death are workable, robust, and reliable. We have an ethical and moral responsibility to our patients, to their relatives, to potential recipients, to other patients who would benefit from ITU facilities which are always limited, and to the medical and nursing staff involved, to ensure that we make a diagnosis and act on it. I would finally say that the diagnosis of death, of brain death, in terms of organ donation is only part of the story. I know that Helen at the beginning said that the majority or virtually all patients come from brain dead donations come from brain dead patients this is not actually true now it used to be true but actually now we have an almost equal number that it come from people following cardiovascular death and our cardiorespiratory death and for that and also of course we have live donors and in fact in this recent year this year now the increase in donors following cardiovascular death is 25 percent increased whereas brainstem donors, dead donors, are static. So basically what I'm saying is that what we're about in diagnosing death is managing individuals' end-of-life choices, but within a clinical hospital setting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, I'd like to draw attention to two kinds of concern that have been raised with regards to the attempt to define human death by reference to uh, irreversible cessation of, of brain function. Uh, the first kind of concern is from uh, an ordinary language uh, perspective. It's perfectly possible for somebody to be diagnosed as brainstem dead, but look alive. Uh, in other words, be ventilated and um, have a, a heart that's beating and be uh, warm uh, to the touch and, and pink. So they, they look alive, and yet um, uh, there's a, a, medical, a medical science uh, way of defining death which focuses on, on, uh, on uh, brain function. And the suggestion is that the, the brainstem uh, definition trumps the ordinary language uh, way of uh, uh, defining death or way of understanding death. From a common sense ordinary language perspective, if somebody looks alive and has a beating heart, they are alive by the uh, ordinary uh, or lay conception of, of death. But in the context of um, diagnosis of brainstem death, the uh, ordinary language uh, the definition is, is, is pushed aside and although 
the, the, the job of the healthcare professional often is to say to the relatives of the deceased, well, they look, they, they look alive, but believe me, they're not really alive. They are actually dead. So that illustrates vividly the clash between the kind of lay conception of death and the scientific conception of death. Now, a question arises, what, what is the authority for the uh, scientific conception of death? If one thinks of death as a, a value-laden concept, then it's not uh, clear why the uh, scientific conception of death uh, can legitimately trump the lay conception. Scientists are expert about facts, but not about values. So that's one kind of concern. A second kind of concern is, well, is, is within the medical paradigm itself. So, well, suppose one accepts that the ordinary language view is, is a mistaken argument and that the scientific conception is itself uh, the, the most uh, appropriate way to, to define death. If one asks, well, why focus on the brain in the first place? The, the standard uh, rationale offered for that is that the brain is a kind of a central control uh, system. And so once the brain uh, irreversibly loses the capacity to function uh, independently, there's no possibility of the, the human being conceived of as a, a biological organism functioning as an integrated whole. That's roughly the rationale for uh, the emphasis that's attached to brain um, function. But, but severe pressure is put on that rationale when one looks at some you know, interesting uh, uh, kinds of uh, cl clinical phenomena. For example, women who are pregnant um, uh, but brain dead, but the, uh, the women are, are maintained in order to uh, um, give the fetus the, the best chance of life. So you have a, a, a brain dead patient but who, who's pregnant, uh, who, who is maintained in the interest of, of, of the fetus. Now, Far from uh, di disintegrating, it seems that those patients do maintain some kind of uh, holistic uh, function. If one looks at uh, the clinical literature on those cases where uh, basically the people involved in them, the, the, the medical staff involved, are describing for the benefits of other medical staff how they manage to maintain patients in that state. There's some, I think from a lay perspective, quite alarming uh, uh, observations one is uh, that there's, there's no clear upper physiological limit to the prolongation of somatic function following brain death. That one commentator says that. Another commentator, again involved in the, the same process, describes a patient who is brain dead as having developed a fever which was successfully treated with antibiotics. Now, if, if those observations are true and they're published in perfectly legitimate scientific uh, journals, it seems to call into question the rationale for um, focusing on the brain as the kind of central coordinator, because they, it, those examples seem to indicate that holistic integrated function is possible after the point at which uh, brainstem death uh, occurs, and that isn't supposed to be possible. Um, now, the, 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 the implications of those concerns are, I think, quite important in the context of organ donation, because although in in, uh, in, generally in medical ethics, the idea of informed consent is considered to be extremely important. And yet many um, people, when they agree to be organ donors, don't uh, do so with knowledge about um, you know, the, the actual process involved. And my suspicion is that many people who agree to be organ donors uh, do so on, on an understanding which is, more, which is closer to the lay conception of death as opposed to the scientific conception of death. So I had a, a, a real concern about informed consent in the context of organ donation, given what I said earlier about the, the prevalence and the, uh, of the um, ordinary language conception of human death, according to which if one has a, a beating heart, is warm and pink, if one looks alive, one is alive. Thank you very much indeed, Stephen. Okay, so I want to make three broad points about organ donation. First, I'm going to very briefly argue against um, presumed consent. Um, then I'm going to talk about what it is about giving up your body that um, causes people a certain amount of pause. And then finally, I'm also going to consider what it means to be dead. Um, so presumed consent, I think, is bad for a couple of reasons. I think it's bad for the first reason because actually, even if we do have presumed consent, it's not going to solve the problem of organ donation. Um, massive improvements in health and safety, particularly road safety, mean that not many of us die in a young, healthy enough state to be organ donors. So at the end of the 1960s, there were around 8,000 deaths on the UK's roads. Um, today, the figure is less than 2,000. There's a reason you get asked to be an organ donor when you pick up your driver's license, but that reason is less than it was. 
So presumed consent might result in more, more organs being available. We're still not going to solve the desperate shortage of organs. The only real solutions to this problem are mechanical organs, xenotransplantation, and growing organs from stem cells, and I think we should focus our efforts there. Presumed consent, and I'm going to argue at the end, organ transplantation in general, tends to distract us from that. Presumed consent is also bad politically because it dismisses people's real fears as irrational or it dismisses people as lazy, and both those things belittle us. In reality, I think everybody knows about organ donation. There are plenty of options to opt in if you want to, and if people are not opting in, um, it's because um, they don't want to, not because they are lazy. So what is it that stops people from opting in? Well, I, whatever it is, I don't think it's religion. Um, there are very, very few um, religious scholars who argue um, against organ donation as it happens. Some South Asian Muslim scholars, some Muftis, jurists oppose donation because they see the body as um, a trusteeship from God and something that shouldn't be desecrated following death. But there is no religion that I know of that formally opposes or forbids the donation or receipt uh, of organs or is against transplantation from living or deceased donors. Um, so it's not um, religion um, that's the problem. So what is it? Well, as it happens, I couldn't find a single study um, that's looked at why people don't volunteer to be an organ donor. Um, there are studies of why family members refuse, but why people themselves don't register appears to be grossly understudied. Um, responding to this, I vox-popped all my friends on Facebook for comments about um, <laughs> any personal objections to being an organ donor. I got about two or three comments. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. I've only got two friends on Facebook, and <laughs> one of them doesn't really like me. But I'm damn detecting a certain squeamishness about bodies and the removal of organs after death. So we do, on the whole, typically think of ourselves as more than flesh and blood. In fact, we typically don't think about our bodies at all while everything's going OK. Um, why would we? We do our things, our bodies hum away in the background. But while we do tend to ignore our bodies in general, when we do think about it, we do intimately think of ourselves as flesh and blood. And perhaps not unreasonably, we are disturbed by the idea that our flesh and blood um, will be violated, even in death. There's an inherent recognition that an intact body is better than one that is separated into parts. Perhaps a different way of thinking about this is to realize that agreeing to organ donation means agreeing to death. Being an organ donor means accepting mortality and the fact that one day you will be nothing more than meat. I consider myself to be pretty rational, but I don't like thinking about that. I'm not fond of thinking that one day I'm going to stop feeling, I'm going to stop experiencing, that I'm going to become a not, not anything, not even nothing, not even not. In short, thoughts of death trigger existential fears, and those fears need addressing, not just dismissing. And just as we don't like to think of ourselves as dead, we also dislike thinking of our loved ones as dead. To be an organ donor, you generally have to be sort of alive, in an alive physiological state that's been discussed already, and I'm sure we'll discuss more. But in essence, what relatives have been asked to consent to um, is the donation of their loved one's organs while their loved one is still warm, still pink, still breathing, still having a heart that beats of its own accord. It's asking a lot of someone that they give up all hope of ever being with that person again, never holding or talking to them again, no final goodbye, while all the time the person seems to be alive in front of them. I'm generally uncertain that it's right to ask people to do that, um, but maybe we can discuss that afterwards. Finally, agreeing to donate organs means agreeing that at some point someone else is going to have control over your bodies. And that control is going to come before the body is dead in the totally unambiguous sense of having no functionality at all. And I do think that's a tricky problem. I think most of us can accept that we lose autonomy once everything has stopped functioning. When everything has stopped, we are truly meat. What happens to us then is of no concern to us because no longer have anything to be concerned about. But organ donation does fudge this. In order to donate, we have to be, in some physical sense, still kind of alive. During illness and on the way to donation, we have little choice but to accept that others are better placed to decide what is best done with our bodies. That requires some element of trust. An awful lot of trust is needed for you to take my heart out. Maybe we don't have that level of trust in our medical professionals right now, and maybe that's something we shouldn't blame the populace for. I'm a neuroscientist, and I argue vehemently against those who suggest patients with a brain stem can experience the world in a meaningful way. I just don't see it as possible. And the majority of organ donors have no brain function at all. Their brain stem and all other areas are dead. They have total brain failure. They are in eyes closed, coma, 24 hours a day. They show no sensitivity to pain. They have no reflex responses that indicate even the simplest brain function. They make no effort whatsoever to breathe unaided. And without mechanical ventilation, the cells and tissues would, in a short time, shut down, and in stillness, they would look like a familiar corpse. 
I'm completely convinced that there's no coming back from that state of total brain failure, convinced enough that I am a registered organ donor myself. But I still hesitate at the thought of my beating heart being removed. It's not irrational, I don't think. It merely reflects the reality that total brain failure is just not as certain as death. If we want to win the argument for people's bodies and death, then we should treat the thoughts and fears of living minds with the respect that they deserve. In conclusion, I'm actually edging towards the belief that human organ donation is only an interim solution and is essentially something that we should eliminate as soon as we possibly can. The difficulties and uncertainties surrounding organ donation and total brain failure necessarily generate discomfort. And the whole idea of organs being a gift of life, of death saving life, also actually tends to fuel a bit of a mystical feeling about bodies. It's much better that we create organs according to need either by growing them from stem cells or with pigs or by making mechanical imitations. In that way, organs can truly become lifeless pieces of meat or machinery that serve the living without any discomfort or mysticism. Key. Thank you very much. I would like to just um, really make this turn on two, uh, uh, two essential points here. One is about altruism and the other is about uh, trust. And in a way, that, I think, is what the whole system of organ donation is built on, is those two things. And the first point to, to make is that I, I don't, as far as I can see, there is no real lack of altruistic intent on the part of people, those of us, that is to say living people, who are all potential donors. Um, surveys demonstrate, uh, quite clearly, I think it's indisputable, that um, upwards of two-thirds... Um, quite possibly significantly more than two-thirds of people, uh, are very sympathetic, very supportive of organ donation. That doesn't uh, suggest to me that there's any lack of altruistic intention amongst people. So the other question on the other side of it is, if we are going to exercise this altruistic intent in the, in the act of donation, uh, do we trust the system to, uh, uh, to actually uh, um, support our wishes, or, or at least not um, be... Uh, uh, contrary to our desires or our interests. And I'm not actually sure that there's, there's very much evidence of a lack of trust either. Um, the fact that so many people are supportive of organ donation in principle um, seems to me um, to be quite uh, significant. Uh, there's also, um, interestingly, um, uh, every year the UK uh, Blood and Transplant carries out an audit of all those people who were potential donors to, to get an idea about why... This, the, the donation actually never took place. And if, in, in an audit of um, over a 1,000 uh, cases where consent was not given uh, when there was a potential donor, the number who cited a reason that was about um, uh, being uh, uncertain or not trusting the system for determining death was below 1%. So uh, the, the, the evidence, I think, needs to be a little bit stronger than that before we start to pointing to this as a reason why people don't trust it. So if we've got this peculiar position whereby most people are supportive of organ donation and most people seem to at least uh, are not demonstrating a lack of trust in the system, why are we getting so few donors? We don't, we don't believe that we're going to be bumped off and so we're refusing to participate. And I think that we have to recognise that there are some other things going on in the background. First of all, I, I was totally shocked when I learned how few people are potential donors. Out of 600,000 people who die every year or thereabouts, fewer than 5,000 are in a position to become donors. So the idea that there are these thousands and thousands of people who are being treated in certain circumstances with the eye to donation is simply not the case. And whilst about 18 million of us have put our names on the organ donor register, the fact is that most of us will never become donors and will never die in circumstances that where it would be possible for us to be donors uh, were, were we to want to. So I think we need to get a, a kind of context on that. Um, the, <coughs> the second um, element is that... Um, uh, you know, what we've learned from, uh, from examining the systems, and a lot of work is going on now, is about uh, managing the circumstances whereby uh, the families are approached, they're approached in the right way, in the, uh, in the right fashion, um, at, at the point where donation becomes a possibility. And there are ways in which that's, that's certainly improving. And the third thing is, and we see this from the, the potential donor audit as well, is that um, where the deceased person had not stated their wishes 
then the refusal rate from their family is very high. I don't know precisely, 50% or so. But where the deceased had clearly expressed their wishes through the organ donor register, then they do proceed to donate in almost all cases. So I think there's an important thing here, which is simply about letting your wishes be known to those um, around you. So this is not about um, a failure to trust the system or to diagnose death. And this, the, the issue that we're talking about here in terms of organ donation is a question in a relatively small number of cases. That doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't ask questions about the definition of death. It doesn't mean to say that it isn't a vital question. It absolutely is. But the first most important thing about the definition of death is about those, um, uh, the, the, the clinical team that is managing the patient and the family having a common understanding about when we've got to the end of this. Not for the purposes of organ donation, but for the purposes of being content that we have arrived at that point where the patient has died. Whether one becomes a donor then is, in a sense, a distinct question. But we have to trust the system. And as I say, fewer than 1% of people where there was a potential donation and it didn't go ahead, in fewer than 1% of cases, the family said that that was the reason, that they didn't trust that. So if I just come back briefly then to the, the starting point, which is about um, altruism and trust, uh, if we talk about um, definition of death, and we also could think about um, uh, um, uh, presumed consent, uh, m my concerns here would be about the extent to which trust becomes lost. If we, st we must think about the definition of death. If we think that this is a, a secret thing for doctors to talk about, we will, lose, we will lose it. It must be done openly and publicly so that we know what's going on. The public is perfectly capable, in my opinion, of realising that there are subtleties to this. That somebody who looks as though you know, they are pink and breathing can nevertheless be dead. I think we can understand this. But if we don't talk about it publicly, we don't have it all in the open, we will never trust the system. So that's the first thing. And about consumed consent, once again, if we start to shift our understanding to the idea that, well, somebody's going to take that body and take those bits if we don't just jump in and stop them, again, we just risk losing our sense of trust in the system for probably very little benefit because the number of additional cases that we would, organs that we would get through a presumed consent system um, is probably uh, relatively small, and it's probably not a price, price that's worth paying. Thank you very much indeed, Hugh. Uh, so my name is David Albert-Jones, and I'm director of the Anscombe Bioethics Centre, which, as you heard, is, is uh, co-sponsoring uh, this event, uh, thanks to the help of uh, a generous benefactor. Uh, I won't say donor in this context, <laughs> but a benefactor. Um, <laughs> Uh, the uh, Anscombe Bioethics Centre is a centre for research into, into biomedical ethics, uh, serving Great Britain and Ireland. It's actually the uh, first bioethics centre, national bioethics centre in the United Kingdom, founded in 1977, and uh, one of the first in, in Europe. Um, so we decided to put on this discussion. Organ donation is not thought of as a typical Catholic issue, if there are Catholic issues uh, of in, in, in ethics. It's, it, people don't associate uh, uh, organ donation with Catholicism. But in fact, there is a significant positive correlation between organ donation and Catholicism. The highest rates of organ donation are from countries with a Catholic cultural identity, such as Spain, Belgium and Ireland. And there is some evidence that uh, within uh, uh, Catholic countries there are higher rates of donation among practicing Catholics, so it doesn't seem fully a cultural. Uh, this positive relationship has been promoted by a number of popes, from Pope Pius XII uh, in the 1950s. So just as organ donation was starting, you had very positive things said about organ donation uh, by popes, and uh, particularly more recently by Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI, our present pope. Um, and this is um, also echoed in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which is the official, uh, a summary, really, of the official teaching of the Church, which says, quote, Organ donation after death is a noble and meritorious act and is to be encouraged as an expression of generous solidarity. So you have strong official teaching in favour, in principle, of organ donation. And you have a positive correlation, particularly in Europe, but I think also throughout the world. 
And I don't think it's too extreme to say that the Catholic Church has been perhaps the largest cultural and institutional supporter of organ transplantation, not only in Europe, but throughout the world. However, this support has been premised on, among other things, the reliability of the determination of death. From a Catholic perspective, there is no question that unpaired vital organs, I'm talking uh, uh, hearts, livers, uh, both lungs, uh, could be taken from a patient who wasn't dead. Uh, dead in the old-fashioned sense, really dead, dead in the sense of no longer being an integrated living organism. It is not enough, from a Catholic perspective, uh, not to be breathing anymore, and uh, not to be able to sp breathe spontaneously. There are people who are very clearly alive who are not able uh, to breathe unassisted. Um, breathing, though a sign of life, is not the only sign of life. It is not enough to be in coma, uh, even permanently. If we are to take ourselves seriously as bodily beings, as flesh and blood, then death must mean the death of the body, not just the impairment of the mind. Finally, it is not enough to say that the heart has stopped. We must have confidence that the, heart can't, the a beating of the heart can't be restored in this patient, that this patient can't be revived. Uh, death, by natural means at least, is irreversible. So we must know that not just we've decided not to reverse it, but that even if we wanted to, we couldn't reverse it because the patient really is dead. That's important with cardiac death because it's a matter of partly how long do you keep the clock going. Um, do you think that the person could be brought back? So the problem that I'm faced with, um, as somebody who's within the Catholic tradition of understanding the, the importance of the sanctity of life, but also the positive benefits of organ transplantation, is that there have been serious philosophers and clinicians who have raised what seem to me to be reasonable doubts about whether organ donors are all dead uh, when their organs are removed. Uh, clearly, they are dead afterwards. Ah, that's, in a way, the problem. Uh, I have no interest in opposing organ transplantation. I, like most Catholics, am strongly inclined to support this area of medicine. However, in order to support it, I need confidence that unpaired vital organs are not taken until the patient is really dead. And I think that even though this hasn't had an impact in a, in a broad social sense, I think that this question is being uh, is subject to a lack of confidence at a higher, at, among academics and on the fringes, and it's among some fringes of the pro-life movement, and in some discussions, and there is a bubbling uncertainty, and there are things which really need to be addressed, because if they're not addressed, then there is a danger of losing confidence, um, not only my personal confidence, I mean, who am I, but of what has been, as a cultural and social force, one of the strongest social supporters of organ transplantation. So this is really something that we need to get right, and I'm not completely confident that we have got it right, but I hope that, uh, I hope that I might be proved wrong already, but, or if not, that we can find a way to uh, establish confidence in a system so that uh, we can both support organ donation and know that organ donation after death is really after death as understood by the communities of people who, who would wish to donate their organs. Thank you very much indeed. Just a, a couple of things to discuss up on the panel first, and then we'll come straight out to the audience. Peter, it seems a long time since you've um, spoken, so I did just want to come, <laughs> come back to you. And, uh, because the, uh, the big issue, it seems to me, raised by many people has been that of trust, and I, that this is the, the big issue here, although that isn't where um, he didn't think that was, that was quite right. I wonder where you stand on, on that particular part of this issue. Well, uh, I can tell you from my own personal experience uh, as, as a clinician, and that is, I think, that provided you handle patients and their relatives in an ongoing and sympathetic way, often over many days, um, that trust is built up. And I don't believe that people feel that they are sort of bamboozled into something that they don't want. I think in this country we do 
we, we, there is a significant pressure on beds and all that sort of thing. And I think that relatives do sometimes feel that their decision-making is being unduly hurried. And for that reason, they say no to donation. They say, I'm sorry, not. But, and there is evidence that says that in countries where you have higher rates and more intensive care beds, life is easier from that point of view. I don't like to hurry anybody. I don't think it's right to hurry anybody. And, and at the same time, what we've got to remember is that we're trying to handle everybody's end of life. It's not just donors. It's, you know, we reach a point in intensive care on a regular basis when we can't do any more. And the question is, how do we handle that in a sympathetic way? How do, are we conscious that people also have different choices, different faiths, different beliefs, have different needs and choices? And we have to respect that. So I, I think if people handle properly, I have confidence it's okay. Okay. Thank yeah. You. Just Stuart and, um, and Steve, I wonder, I mean, Hugh's saying that trust isn't an issue at all, so I wonder how you respond to his, to his argument there. I mean, I think the audit you, you cited is very useful, and I wasn't aware of that, but I guess it, it, to some extent that, that's missing the point, to, because it, it's not that um, people are outwardly saying, you know, I don't trust doctors, they're going to you know, pull my organs out before I'm dead. I mean, that, that would be a pretty extreme belief. I think it's more that there's a certain hesitancy, a certain reluctance that enters into people's thinking when they are presented with the option of becoming an organ donor. And they go, mm, you know, I'm not sure I do want to do that. And then it's not that they feel that, you know, they're going to get attacked um, in that kind of overt way. But doctors do come under pressure um, for beds. They do come under pressure because they've got a, um, a patient who desperately needs a heart and you've been entered into the ward and guess what? Your heart's a fit for that patient. Pressure will be applied. So I think there's a certain element of this is something that I'm not quite prepared to commit to, um, just in case. I don't want to be that one person who accidentally or for whatever reason gets taken before I'm really gone. I think it's at that kind of level. Yeah, on the issue of trust, um, I'm very concerned about the issue of trust. And my concern is that the kind of um, arguments that I try to summarize that aren't original to me by any means be reported in an irresponsible way, in a way and in a way which um, un undermines the organ donation uh, program in a way that it was undermined in the early 1980s by program probably hardly anybody here is old enough to remember but the panorama program which, which did just that. And my fear is that unless the debates about the way we define death um, are uh, laid out in, in the open, uh, a, a similar crisis of confidence in the, the organ donation uh, procedure process, sorry, uh, m might uh, arise. So, Peter, you want to come back? Uh, just one thing. I, I would just like to correct one thing that Stuart said, and that is that um, there are there isn't there aren't cases where you give an organ because you know somebody needs it as an individual. You give an organ to the register, yeah, that, that's and not, that that's is allocated. Yeah, yeah. So you don't have this position of having somebody in one bed waiting for somebody for somebody else. I'm sorry, but I just in case that yeah, was yeah, yeah, exactly. an opinion, an uh, impression. Very quickly, David and Hugh, actually. What, uh, Stuart talked about human organ donation as an interim solution. I just wonder what you th thought about that. <laughs> Simon Johnson said, in the long run, we are all dead. Um, and, and so interim, we, we live our life with interim... Uh, um, uh, interim solutions. So I don't think. Uh, I think that the, that if there are if organ donation um, is morally acceptable, I think it certainly is helpful. A help, very helpful medicine for some people at the, at the moment for some thousands of people. So so um, if if I, I can be. Sure that the, 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 there isn't really a problem uh, or the, the problems can be solved with respect to, to, to worrying about death. I think that this will be very important for quite a long time, and that 's certainly therefore worth talking about now, even if even if in, in fifty years or one hundred years we 've moved on to a different kind of medicine. I think that it's that, that we, we need to look at look at organ donation and, and even very old medicine still tends to hang around. Mm -hmm. No matter what what new things come come along, so 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 I will be very surprised if uh, uh, medicine which now works 
which saves people's lives or changes people's lives is completely eradicated even by, by new kinds of, of technologies. Just as we, we use uh, live donor, donors sometimes as well as, as, as dead donors, and there's a sort of uh, movement between the two, and, and we haven't got rid of live donors just because we have dead donors. Live donors started as a sort of earlier um, technology. So I, d I th don't think the problem's going to go, go away, away in that sense. Uh, I think it's, it, it's important to, 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 to address it and get it right. Can I just make f uh, a few very, I will be very, very quick. Uh, first, I, I, I'm certainly not saying that trust is not um, uh, important. Uh, uh, what I'm saying is that trust is essential. It's just that I think that we've actually got quite a lot of it yeah. and we need to protect it. Yeah. One of the ways to protect it is to make sure, as Steve said, if we are going to talk about the definition of death, and we must, that we do it openly. It's not something that you know, doctors talk about in their funny you know, colleges somewhere. That, that it must be something that we, that, that we all um, uh, recognise. I, I think that um, you know, David's uh, uh, dilemma is a, is a real one, and I think it's a, you know, an important question that he's saying, well, I, we want to support organ donation, but we want to be, have that confidence that this, is, that this is right. And I think that if we approach that question not in the sense that we think they're doing something terrible, but rather in the sense that we've just got an ongoing question of how to make sure that we've got the best understanding that we have at this time. That's a, actually a, 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 a positive way to, um, uh, to approach it. So um, there was something else really, really interesting and important that I was going to say, and I've just forgotten it. There's two points I want to raise. First of all, sh should it be put in the, in the guidelines or in the regulations that physicians that diagnose death um, should be blinded as to the, the donor status of the, of the patient um, to prevent any bias uh, that may occur <laughs> from that. And um, this, the second thing is, um, well, I, I personally you know, think that uh, Xenocraft and all the craft technologies are a long way from replacing allograft technology. Um, and and um, I, I personally am very much in favor of an opt-out system because um, I do think that people are inherently lazy, especially, you know, um, youth is inherently lazy. We don't want to spend hours sort of looking into the technical deeds of death, etc. And I think it would be very good if the government would sort of make us do that, make us sort of um, make an informed choice on this. It, you know, the government makes us do things every year. I have to fill in my tax reform every year. Um, so it's not, it's not um, um, you know, an <coughs> unreasonable requirement <coughs> Uh, from the government to ask to the population. Okay, thank you. I'd like to raise um, or pick up the issue which you um, raised vis-a-vis uh, -vis the spectre of presumed consent. Um, as someone who had originally trained as a, um, as a medical lawyer, um, I was always taught that the body um, was not a form of property, it could not be considered a form of property, and it certainly could not be appropriated by the state. Um, I have tremendous... Uh, difficulties with the issue of uh, presumed consent because my body is mine it does the state has no claim of property over me in life the state has no claim of proper of, of property in death um, and finally I agree with you absolutely I think that trust is not just important it, it is essential but introducing um, presumed consent um, I removing explicit consent from the patient or the patient's family I think will only and can only jeopardize this Okay, thanks. I really agree with the point that, that's just been made. Um, I just wanted to ask a, a question really about coming back to this thing about defining beginnings and ends of life because I'm sure David will agree it really is, it seems to touch on this question. Um, I think it clearly also touches on the other issue which is the, the abortion question as well. It's that whole business of when does life begin and when does it end? And it is hugely interesting because clearly in this discussion, this is, has been very concerned with an end of life issue and this sort of whole notion of whether there is something more to us than the pink flesh and the beating heart. And it strikes me that perhaps for both the discussion of the beginning and ending of life in the old days when we could talk about faith and belief in religion and you could talk about ensoulment and the soul being in the body or the soul leaving the body, it was much easier to talk about a beginning and ending of 
life in something that was more than just the purely biological organic. But since we don't talk about that even more, and even David doesn't from a Catholic point of view, um, that whole notion of what is the meaning of the human bit of human life and when does it begin to matter, I think becomes posed in a secular way as well as a religious way. And I'm just wondering what the panelists really think about that. The, what do we mean about the humanness of human life? And when does it really matter? Because I think that touches on the essence of both the beginning of life and the ending of life. Thank you very much. I've taken a rather close interest in the subject, not only from my academic background as a theologian, but also because 22 years ago I had a kidney transplant. And I was certainly wanting to reassure myself that the donor from whom I received that transplant was well and truly dead. I would not have wanted it on my conscience that I had benefited from the death of someone else. One of my worries about uh, presumed consent is that uh, if an organ is taken, the recipient is going to be very uneasy about the circumstances in which that organ is taken. And I also think that the recipient's ability to reject is both physical and psychological, and that I think there is some evidence that organs can be rejected by patients who have received them in circumstances that uh, perhaps they are unhappy about. So uh, my main point, I think, would be that the giving of an organ, the donation, the emphasis should much more be put on that idea of it being a gift. So a person in life is asked to be a donor. They're asked to give something very precious of themselves at that time that they are dead. And I would go along with the, the idea, too, that we're not really asking the question enough. 18 million people on the register at the moment. Now, let us say that was doubled, and that the statistics suggest that that would almost double the number of um, organs that were coming available. Now, why are people not being asked? Now, I have lobbied for several um, decades now that when the census comes round, you know, that, all, that large form we all have to fill in and, and give every detail of our life, why is the question not put on the census? Okay, it would be an ideal opportunity, but I would put the emphasis on the gift. Thank you very much. David, can I start with you? Uh, yeah, well, uh, as yeah. there was a <laughs> question directly uh, addressed to me about not, not being Catholic enough, uh, <laughs> and, and not talking about the soul. Um, I, I think it's interesting. Uh, uh, Pius XII in the 1950s essentially uh, um, referred this to the doctors and said, well, if somebody's unconscious, then it's really a medical decision. It's a clinical, technical decision. But I think that what, happens, what has happened subsequently has shown that it isn't simply a medical decision, that, it, that, that there, um, there are different philosophies uh, at work and different people understand death in different ways. And in particular, whether you think of permanent unconsciousness as being equivalent to death, or whether you think of, of uh, inevitable uh, prognosis of imminent death as being equivalent to death, whether it's sort of ethically equivalent to death. Those are they're actually doing some work for some, some, some people out there. Um, and, and in particular, uh, I mean, the definition was just given earlier, uh, death is the, the irrevers irreversible loss of, of uh, ability to breathe and irreversible loss of consciousness combined. I, I don't accept that definition. I, I simply deny that definition. I think that it's a philosophical question what constitutes death, and it requires decent argument for, in order to, put, to defend that definition, and I would oppose that definition. That's a, not to say that uh, I think that the, the clinical criteria are necessarily wrong. I'd have to look at the clinical criteria. But that particular definition I don't think is right. And the question of that definition is a philosophical question on which people will disagree and which is informed, among other things, by their religious view of, of um, um, not just uh, are we souls and bodies, but, but, but also how much we think of ourselves as, as in, in, uh, integrated as how much holists we are, how much dualists we are in various ways. There are different attitudes people bring to this, 
so I don't think it's just a clinical. I don't think it's just a clinical question, uh, which is another reason why I think people ought to be informed about what's going on. Okay, thank you, um, Steve. Yeah, I'll just uh, if I can pick up on some of the questions that were raised about in presumed consent. The first questioner said, uh, quite, um, perceptively, people are quite lazy, and that's probably why they don't get round to uh, opting in as we uh, to, to donate their organs. Uh, I, I, uh, I, Hugh observed there isn't much literature on this, but I, I, I guess that's right, and that explains the mismatch between the statistic that Hugh um, gave us about two thirds of people being sympathetic, that not being reflected in the organ donation register. You know, it's not the case that two thirds of the population are registered, if, if I remember accurately. Uh, the point about presumed consent being a misnomer, I think one has to accept that. It's, it's a, a, a dubiously coherent, perhaps even incoherent term. But one um, can still separate that question about what the, the label would be for the, the process of um, presuming somebody's organs are available for transplant if they haven't um, uh, opted out, if they haven't uh, expressly said, I do not want my organs taken. One can still um, legitimise what would be covered under the name of uh, presumed consent, but just find a, a more accurate name for it. Pre presumed consent is completely uh, the, the wrong name, I agree. Uh, and somebody else mentioned, presumably, oh, the gift business. Yeah, this is a, one of the, I mean, I live in Wales, so we had a, a lot of debates about this in Wales at, at the moment because it looks like the Welsh Assembly will introduce presumed consent in Wales shortly. Um, the gift argument is one that's, that's uh, raised very frequently, and I, I am very sympathetic to that. I mean, the standard response is, if you speak to people who, who, who just as vigorously support presumed consent, they say, well, well by not opting out, one still kind of gives the gift. So, you know, uh, one, 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 thinks, one can still think of oneself as doing something uh, for the good of, of somebody else by not opting out. So the gift op objection, I think, is taken care of by, by that move. So those are three observations on three important topics raised by questioners on, on the specific issue of presumed consent. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Peter. Quickly, are doctors blinded? when they do the testing, yes they are, in the sense that it is not they who request organs. That is the job of the specialist nurse. So that they, when they say they're blinded, they just don't get involved in the process of requesting organs. So they don't know when they're doing the tests that organs are going to be sought. And they don't know whether the patient's on the register or not. Um, what about mandated consent, which is what you're really referring to? It's used in some countries. Um, I think, though, whether we consider that or presume consent or what we have at the moment, the thing that we haven't really talked about is whether that consent is in any way informed. The problem we have, and the thing I've been trying to get what was UK transplant to get into, is this idea of people realising what they're actually signing up to. Because when we do it, we sign our driving licence, whatever we do, we don't actually know what the process is. And while it's pretty grisly, if you to think about it now, you might not want to, one of the problems that we have in intensive care with somebody dying is actually the relatives saying, gosh, I didn't realise it involved all that, that's horrible, you know, sort of thing. And it would be much better if people who actually signed up by whatever route actually did so knowing what the process was that was involved. Because I think then you would genuinely get people who knew what they were expecting and were content for that. You can take that a stage further, if you wish, and say that some people might say, um, actually, if I'm going to donate an organ, I want my organ to be in the best possible nick. In which case, if you want to give me drug X or Y beforehand, because that will improve its function, that's fine by me, whereas other people might not want that. And this is all about a level of informity. And, and I, I think that these are, these are things which we need to consider. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, yes, well I, well, I won't go, go around that question again. I think um, mm. in, uh, uh, presumed consent, I, I've already made clear that, that there, there's a risk that it will undermine uh, trust. I think the, the, the availability of information for informing this is really, really important as well. There's just a couple of other things that I wanted to, to, to come back to. Um, uh, one was about uh, alternatives, whether the organ donation is, is you know, the thing that we're going to arrive at. Um, certainly... Um, artificial organs or, um, or, or artificially generated tissue uh, is one possibility, but it is some distance away. But there's another side to this, because um, 
one can look at this in terms of supply and demand. You know, the, there is not a sufficient supply of organs, but then there has been an increasing demand. And part of that is driven by, um, uh, you can call it changes in lifestyle or you can change, call it changes in uh, environment or, or, or whatever. Um, but there are ways in which we could limit the demand for hearts, livers, lungs, etc. And I think that sometimes we concentrate on upping the number of organs being made available for transplant rather than on recognising that there are ways in which we can actually limit um, demand. And there's, there's an important public health uh, dimension to that. The second thing is just two brief points which are, are um, about this question. Again, it, I think it goes to the, to the question of, 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 of trust in the practitioners. Um, and one is, you asked about intensive care specialists. Well, I, you know, I did work on in, in transplant policy some time ago, and what I discovered then was that the transplant surgeons feel and have felt for a very long time that they do not get any help from the intensivists. And there has been a standoff for a long time between these because the transplant surgeons are saying, why the bloody hell don't they help us deliver these organs? And the intensivists are saying, this is my patient. I'm not, this is not here for you. And that actually has been a cultural thing within the medical professional that has inhibited the obtaining of organs from patients to, uh, if, you, if you hear it from the transplant surgeons. And the other thing, just very briefly, is this goes back hundreds of years, actually. If you go back into kind of late, mid to late Victorian <coughs> times, people were being asked to be kept um, for several days before they were put in their um, uh, coffins and buried because they were worried uh, 150 years ago that people were not adequately defining the moment when they had died. And again, this is not about somebody nipping in to grab their organs to transplant them, but just about getting an improving and increasingly uh, sophisticated understanding of when death had occurred so it could be agreed between practitioners and, and doctors and, and, and families um, to, for everybody's just comfort and satisfaction generally before you come to the question uh, of organ donation. Okay, Stuart, finally, and then sure. we're going to go back out to... Yeah, I do, I do want to come back to this point about presumed consent because I really despise this argument that people are, are lazy because I think it's a really lazy argument as it happens. Um, I don't say that we should have barriers in front of um, people becoming organ donors. There are some countries in the world, Germany in particular, where it's quite hard to be an organ donor. I think that's silly. But in most countries of the world, and Britain included, it's very easy to be an organ donor. If you want to do it, it's very, very simple. And if people are not doing it, it's because they have a reason. They might not be able to articulate it, they might not be able to understand it fully themselves, but there are reasons behind why people are not becoming organ donors. And we should work out what those reasons are and argue with them if we think this is important, not force them into a system that some expert panel thinks is more rational and better for everybody. On the question of um, xenotransplantation and other techniques of developing organs, I, I'm not arguing that those technologies are advanced enough that they can be used now. Uh, I do think there's probably more optimism than perhaps in this room, but nevertheless, even if the, the future is a long way away, um, what I'm arguing for is a change in attitude towards organ donation. So taking um, organs from cadavers is a bad way of solving this problem. It's a bad way of solving this problem because there aren't enough organs. It's a bad way of solving this problem because the organs come in all kinds of various conditions. They're dirty, they're messy, we can make them cleaner. And it's a bad argument um, because it creates vexed problems about what is death and, and um, how do we define death. And there's an inherent uncertainty and problematization problematic um, nature of those debates, which I don't think is entirely resolvable. So we should basically say we're doing this in the interim. Um, it's a better solution than doing nothing, but we want to get away from it as quickly as we can. I also don't like the attitude um, towards organ donation that's created around things like it's an act of altruism, um, it's a gift. I don't think it is actually altruistic to give up your organs when you're dead, because dead people are not capable of acts of altruism. I don't think it's a gift. I don't think you're giving something precious of yourself. There's nothing precious about your organs when you're dead. They're not precious to you anymore. They're useless to you. Um, so I think it, it introduces an element of, of mysticism into the debate as well, which we can do without. Okay. Um, I just want to talk um, a little bit about risk. Um, I'm about to make a kidney donation to a relative, and I've been through a process of about a year to get to this point. Um, and it is informed the one has to understand the risks involved and one is tested on your understanding of the risks involved and I think that if 
that that, that, that is, is possible to do with dead organ do donation, that one would be willing to opt in to donating organs as a dead person and to say that you understood the risks that were involved in that and that you opted for a certain definition of death that you felt comfortable with. Um, I would say that through the process that I have gone through, that has been um, a really interesting process because it is also a deeply spiritual one. And um, probably as a very non-religious person, the most spiritual thing that I have ever been through. And I think that that is possible to transfer that to agreeing to give your organs um, as a dead person. Um, uh, but I think the processes by what, which one can opt into that are just not there. I have never in my life been asked to do that. And I think that if it was more proactive um, thing f to be asked, that many, many more people would opt into it if they really understood what it was about. My name is Sonny Gilland. I run the debating matters competition that's been referred to, and we've debated this a lot with uh, students. One of the things that's frustrated me about this debate is the idea that seems to be inherent in it is, is that saving life trumps all else. And the more that I hear this debate go on, the more as sympathetic as I am to organ donation and, 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 and that being a good thing, the more I get concerned that actually what's going on uh, in this debate is that we're all being lectured to about making the wrong choice and that we're making bad choices or immoral choices and we yeah. don't have the right attitude. Now, no one wants to say that they're lecturing to you and everyone says they're very respectful of different uh, attitudes and religions and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But there is a, a frustration that's conveyed by people promoting uh, these sorts of debates and discussions that people are doing the wrong thing and that's why so many thousands of people each year die unnecessarily. Uh, and that seems to trump uh, everybody else's uh, views, whether that's, whether that's laziness or disinterest or all the uncomfortable feelings that Stuart has spoken about and the uh, myriad reasons why people <laughs> might not want to do it. It seems that the saving of life trumps everything else uh, in this and, and, and that, that makes me very uncomfortable. Thank you very much. Good morning, Eustace Jones from Anscombe Bioethics Centre. I've got a question for probably Sir Peter in terms of the costs of organ transplant. In Japan, um, if, when someone dies and if someone is registered as a donor, the organ transplant mm. operation is going to be held in that hospital. And the thing is that the whole cost, for instance, the operation or delivery of kidney or heart by helicopter or police car and so on, they're all down to that hospital. For that reason, the, uh, some of the Japanese hospitals are quite reluctant about performing organ uh, transport, uh, transplant. Sorry. So I wonder if it's to a certain extent the case in this country as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think there's a real problem in this discussion about how we talk about organ donation as being in promoting it on the basis of altruistic terms or whether we're going to talk about it rationally. And I think at the moment what we're doing is both. And I think it's a real problem because this notion of giving a part of your humanness, uh, as it were, to another person to make them more human or to give them life isn't, strictly speaking, a rational concept. It's not a scientific concept. And I think if you want to talk about the sort of dead, the, the real sense of dead in terms of brain dead and organs as being pieces of meat or parts of a, uh, not being parts of a person necessarily um, for the use of whether it's scientific research or for transplantation, then you're going to have to, then you're going to run into a conflict with this idea of gift giving and doing something that's altruistic. Thank you. I've got a very unpopular view in Britain of what I think should be done with uh, organ donation. So I'm just going to tell you about it and hopefully you can give me some new criticism. Um, I am of the view that we should be able to sell our own organs. Um, and my reasons are that the financial benefit to NHS would be great. The example of Iran eliminating the kidney organ donation waiting list and the fact that I just think we should be allowed to do that. And altruism clearly isn't working, but you would still have the option to be altruistic and to give up your organs for free. Um, and I believe that with any other kind of market, housing market, there's going to be dissatisfied donors, but um, that we should be viewing it as something that we are allowed to do, as being autonomous with our own bodies. So I'd like to know what you think about that. Okay. The question 
two of the speakers have mentioned holistic integrated functioning as a criterion for someone being alive and that death is the, the dissolution of, of that integrated functioning. Could the people who, um, are, who think that brain death um, is a, um, a good criterion of death um, say a bit more about the arguments against that, because it seems like a, a biological account of integrated biological functioning, um, and it, not just a biological account, but it makes some intuitive sense when we hear about a woman who can bring her child to term while being brain dead. This, she's alive, in a sense. So what are the arguments against that view? Okay. Yeah, I just wondered uh, what the panel thought about how we need to actually... Do we really need to agree on what death is about this? Can we not just put forward a, a situation which we, which, is, which we call brain death and say, if you want to give your organs when you're brain dead, and this is what brain death is, as decided by doctors, as then diagnosed by doctors, um, then donate your organs. And if, if that's something that you're personally content with and can rationalise yourself, then sign up to it. If you don't think that makes you dead, if you don't think that criteria is you dying, then don't sign up to it. And therefore, kind of like, put some more complexity when it comes to consenting people for it in the first place? Uh, I was asked specifically about cost. The answer is that the cost is borne by the whole of the NHS. Hospitals that have a donor are reimbursed a nominal sum for looking after that donor and providing the facilities for donation to take place. It's modest. It's about £2,000, I think. The rest of it is done as, a, as an NHS-based thing. Um, there was a question, really, about whether... Um, people should know what brain, you know, they should be able to sign up according to whether they understand what brain death is. In other words, probably um, could they say, well, I'm happy, but I'm not happy for my death to be diagnosed by those criteria, but I'm happy with it that way, or something like that. Um, this is all, I think, part of an informed consent process. Uh, and I don't think, what, you know, at the moment, uh, my belief is I wish people would know more, and the question is how we get it out there. With regard to the question about a pregnant lady who is brain dead, is about the only, it's always brought out, but this is the only one of these, really, that comes to the fore. The question is really that if, when we're talking about, the imagination is that actually all you do is you put the lady who's, so say, uh, brain dead uh, uh, on a ventilator, you do nothing else at all, and she actually carries on with her pregnancy to term. That, of course, isn't what happens. Basically, they have all sorts of support therapy. And if you use all sorts of support therapy, you can carry on with somebody who is brain dead. Yeah, I don't doubt that. The question is, what, at what point do you decide that the support therapy should be discontinued? In this case, when the baby's been delivered. Or otherwise, when another thing does or doesn't happen. So I, I think it's actually slightly artificial, really. Um, I, I, you know, it, it's a difficult... It, brain death is a difficult concept, but we have to have a working definition to use in healthcare. Just what, uh, because there was um, a question about whether saving life trumps all else that was directed towards you. I wouldn't... I, uh, can I, can yes, I pick that up? Because um, I think that there is a... It, it is a really interesting point, and I, just speaking personally, um, I, I kind of have a lot of sympathy for, the, for, the, for what Tony was getting at, was, was, which is the idea that, well, no, we don't have to save every life in all circumstances and do everything we possibly can to do that. And um, if we fall short in the number of organs that are available for transplant, um, and therefore some people are going to die whilst waiting... Um, we don't have to say, well, therefore, we've failed. We're going to have to do something else. We're going to have to start paying people who are alive for their organs. Now, I, I think that that's, a, you know, that's an alternative. I'm not sure that in Iran they will tell you that it's all worked just fine because I'm not sure that it has. Um, uh, and, and, the, and the difficulty, as much as anything else, is well, two difficulties. One, the, 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 the exploitation, the, the fact that, uh, money will travel in this direction, organs will travel in that direction, and the money won't solve anybody's poverty problems, um, and it will undermine other parts of the system. But, I mean, essentially, if there is, um, if you want to call it, I don't want to call it altruism, I, I don't really mind, but there is a good intent on the part of most people uh, to support uh, organ donation. There is a failure within the system to uh, deliver the, uh, that intent. Uh, there are people whose lives could be saved. Um, so I think that it's not a question of 
lecturing or telling people that they ought to be donating organs, because if people choose not to, I think that's fine. It's rather um, making sure that the people who do wish to are enabled. OK, thanks. David? Yeah, I, thank you for the question about uh, life dropping all else. I, so, not in this context, but in some other context when one talks about um, uh, organ donation, I, I get the feeling I'm in some kind of revivalist meeting, uh, and there's a kind of evangelical zeal to, to get people to, to, you know, to confess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour and sign the organ donor card at the same time. So there's, there's, sort of, there's this sort of urge to conversion, and just as in, just as in religion, I'm uneasy about that way of... Uh, uh, um, welcoming people to, to understand the faith. So I am also with regard to, to, to organ donation. That is to say, there's a kind of pushy, there can be a kind of pushiness where you, you, you're so concerned about the object, which is a good object, that you sort of, you, you cut the, 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 you're not actually addressing this person with proper respect. And I think that can be a real problem. And it's more of a real problem the more keen you are on the good. It's not just within this context, I think. Other things happen where you have an overwhelming good and then it seems to sort of trump all other things. With regard to different kinds of definition of death for different people, uh, in New Jersey they have a law where, where uh, if you, you're, bred, you're dead if you're brain dead unless you don't want to be, uh, which, is, <laughs> which, is, which is a compromise uh, for, the, for, the, for the Jewish community in New Jersey and it's quite a... Jewish compromise, really. Uh, it's, uh, there's a problem that I, I have some sympathy with it, um, but also uh, people, as well as the political thing, people actually do also want to do the right thing, and they do ask people, thinking, well, what do you think? And particularly people come to me to say, well, well what do you think? And so it's not enough to me, for me to say, well, just decide for yourself. I have to, to come, come to a view and say, well, this is, this is the view that, uh, as, as far as, as I'm concerned as far as the best evidence that we've got out there. I, I, one tiny little extra point. I don't think the test for being discontinuous, for, for, for discontinuing treatment, futile treatment, is the same as the test for whether somebody's dead or not. There are many contexts in which you would discontinue treatment. And, I, and, and mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of tests, a lot of, cause, cause you, and, I, and, and I think there's a little merging of those two, two things. So I think the test for discontinuing treatment, futility for treatment, is different from the test for are you dead or not. Yeah. And, and the, the, the are you dead or not test has to be a more rigorous test. That's fine. Thank you. Steve? Well, just, uh, I was about to make exactly the same point that David made, but he put it far better than I could have done. <laughs> so there, there are two importantly different questions. One question, is the patient alive or dead? The second question, is this a good use of resources to maintain a person like this with a very dim prognosis, a person who's never going to kind of be conscious again, uh, lead any kind of uh, good life in any plausible sense of what a good life is? That's an ethical question about the, how one best, how resources should best be used, which is separable. Uh, it's my mind importantly separable uh, from the prior question: Are they alive or dead? And I, I agree with David. It's 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 um, it's um, um, well, I, I'm struggling for the adjective, but it's not. Uh, it's hard to defend. I would say com c conflating the two questions, in my in my opinion. Okay, let's do it. Yes, I'm in the unusual position of finding myself in agreement with a lot of the comments that came from the floor. So I mean, I did very much agree with Tony that there's something. <laughs> a bit pernicious about this discussion that we're bashing people for being selfish for not putting themselves on the organ donation list and I do find that a really unpleasant argument it's the same arguments behind presumed consent that people are basically lazy irrational and selfish and we know what's better for them so let's um, let's make the decision on their behalf and that's that's out of order and the lady at the front makes a point about there's something paradoxical about this discussion you know it's uh, you know, talking about altruism and giving of gifts you know if you're being altruistic, if you're giving something that's precious to you, then, well, you know what, maybe you shouldn't, because if it's precious to you in that moment, then it's useful, and maybe you shouldn't be giving up your organs under those circumstances. So there's a certain paradox there. I just want to come back to the gentleman's point about, um, you know, the lady that's pregnant and is kept alive, and, and what, what does that mean? And I think this comes back to the, the point Anne was making earlier about what, what the humanness of life, you know, it's... They are alive in a technical kind of way, but if they're total brain death, they have no means of thinking, feeling, responding, reacting, doing anything in any kind of way. I don't think that's life in any meaningful way. She's not alive. What, what she is, is is an, a very sophisticated incubator for a baby for that period of time, but that's not life. I also get that there's something really vexed about that, and it's not as clean as if she was actually dead. 
And, and therein lies the paradox, which is why I think one of the many reasons I think this is just not a good way of solving the problem that we're faced with. OK. I know that Peter wants, still wants to say something, so I want to just give everybody the chance to just give a, a sentence just to um, bring, bring this to a, a close, um, because we do need to finish. So, Hugh, if I can start with you and we'll just move it on. This isn't wrapping up everything that I think in one sentence, but I think there's just something in here which is, uh, you know, being challenged to, to, to respond to the question of integrated functioning and whether this definitely... Uh, I can't do it. I, I, and I don't think everybody should be expected to arrive at a definition of death, which is an incredibly difficult, sophisticated thing. There is, if for, from, from, if you, from a religious or spiritual point of view, you have certain beliefs. I don't have any of those. I, I'm not an atheist. I, it doesn't come into it. But I can't decide that. I need to rely on people who I trust to have worked it through and to have done it openly in discussion with as many people as want to join in and I want to be able to rely on that system. And so this is where I think that if I do want to donate, and I will, I want to be able to rely on that system. So we need transparency and trust to support people's uh, uh, informed intentions. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Peter. Thank you. One word about altruism. While I accept that you don't like the idea for people who put their name on the register, the one group I would urge you to think about are relatives faced with a tragedy whose relative is not on the register and who are asked if they are willing. That is an altruistic act, I think, and that is slightly different. It, my ambition with all this is not in any way to badger people to be on registers or put people on registers who don't want to be. My ambition is to create sufficient confidence in the process, both amongst medical staff and then amongst the public, that they want to do it, if they want to do it, and they have a choice to do it. But it shouldn't be because they are worried about they don't know what they're letting themselves in for, which is a bit the point that you were making. And I think it's really important that if you can get that confidence there, you will get a good uptake. There's a good uptake already, but we do need to have a better informed public. Thank you. David? Organisation, I think, has, has positive outcomes and, and because of that is worth recommending to people. Not necessarily bragging, but recommending to people. But... Uh, not above all else, and it has to be done uh, uh, properly and ethically. And one of the ethical criteria is that if, if you say that they're dead, they really are dead. Uh, and, uh, and that's something that, that's a discussion I think we still, we still uh, need to have. Because as we've heard, it's, it's, it's death, Jim, but not as we know it. Thank you. Stuart? Yeah, so just very quickly, I need to respond to Peter. Yeah, I, I agree. Relatives are put in an incredibly difficult position when they're asked to um, give up their loved one for organ donation. And, and it's another reason why I think this particular method of solving the problem is not brilliant. Um, people say that they're very supportive of organ donation, and I'm sure they mean it. But as it happens, um, it's not reflected in behaviour. And I do think that reflects a certain reticence about organ donation. And I think there are um, good reasons behind that, the main one being that this isn't a very good way of solving the problem. So let's move to do something else. Thank you. Steve. Well, very, very briefly, I'm in favour of um, organ transplantation, but also in favour of informed consent. And I, I know Peter has raised the same concerns. It, it, it concerns me that many people agree to be on the organ donor register with, with less, much less than informed consent about the process and debates like some of the ones that have occurred this morning. Thank you very much. Please, can we thank um, our panel?